Hello, everybody. This is Jonathan Senor Smoke from uh, Curto's here in beautiful and bucolic Yonkers, and I'm uh, privileged to have a. Uh, this is really my first uh, celebrity interview. I'm here with <laughs> Cur champion pitmaster Curtis Nations, who is uh, leading the Traeger shop class. Uh, here are Curto's these uh, past two evenings. Curtis, welcome to Yonkers. Thank you. Thank you. And Good Curtis has blazed a trail of brisket and ribs all the way from Utah to Yonkers, and we're very happy to have him. So I wanted to just um, go over a few things, kind of primarily focused on the brisket, which everybody it seems to be everybody's uh, favorite cut and the most challenging cut of meat uh, to work with. Um, Curtis, the other day I had mentioned to you that I made brisket over the weekend and I ruined it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what happened or what went wrong. But if you could, if you had three um, tried and true principles to make a great brisket, what, what do you think they would be? So I think the quality of the meat's the biggest thing to make sure that you get a prime at least. Um, it makes a big difference in the overall cook. And then I think people overcomplicate, especially brisket. They think there's all these steps that they have to go through where there's really not. Um, time, there's not really a time. I give myself 12 hours. They usually take between nine and 11, but it holds really well. Actually gets better as it holds. So I always set myself up for a 12 hour cook. It's usually a nine or 10, but gives me that extra couple hours to let it rest. And that's uh, that's the full packer brisket. Yeah, the whole packers. I very rarely cook anything but that. Mm. I think they just turn out better. There's a lot more fat in between the two pieces of meat. And I think they just turn out better that way. Okay, so your first um, your, your first thing to key in on is just having yeah. a great piece of meat. What would, what would number two be? Uh, just to leave it alone. You know, just, I trim it. I'll take about, I take as much fat off the top of it as I can. Mm -hmm. And then I go down to a quarter inch on the bottom. And then I throw it on a Traeger 225 and I walk away for six hours. I don't touch it, I don't open it. Um, I think a lot of people try and mop, they spritz. To me, that ruins the bark. You want that bark to set. You want it to get sticky, tacky. No water know, pan or beer no, pan. No, no water pan, anything in there. Okay. The, on a Traeger, the, the cooking environment's pretty moist already, so there's mm -hmm. no need for the extra moisture. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Just walk away for six hours. Six hours. Yeah. And then and I then, think you had said about your wrapping at that point. At that point, I wrap. Um, I like to use foil. So I do a double layer of foil. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of guys like to use the butcher paper, the pink paper. Make yep. sure you get a, a pink un, unwaxed, because some of the butcher paper you find will have a wax coating yes. on one side. Well, that's like the Aaron, Aaron yeah. Franklin has popularized yeah. yes, that, uh, has. that style. Yeah. So, um, so you find, so basically when you're using the foil, I guess it's the Texas crutch, whatever they call yeah, it. Yeah, they call it that. Yep. And, and so you find the consistency comes out very nice with that. I like the texture better. Um, I think it's a little more tender, but and, and I like both ways. But do you I find though that the with the foil? So the thing I would be concerned about is that the foil, since it's holding so much moisture in there, it could potentially inhibit the formation of the bark. You, you, it does a little bit. Okay. Um, but again, I I like the texture enough to where I don't mind it as much. Okay. And a, as I wrap it in foil, I get it really tight. Because a lot of the um, times people will just kind of loosely wrap it, okay, and then you get a lot of steam in there. Yes. So that's what washes the bark. So you away. got a tight, a tight yeah, wrap. Yeah, tight wrap oh, on wow. there. Um, if you really like the bark a lot, after after I was finished cooking, mm -hmm. after I've let it rest, I would take it out, put it back on the grill at 225 for maybe a half hour. That'll reset your bark if that's what you like. Mm -hmm. I don't do that, but that's definitely a way to go if you like that bark. Okay. Yeah. And what, what would your third step be to a, to a semi-perfect brisket? Uh, the finish temp is the biggest thing, and it's high. You know, most people say, oh, you know, I've, when I first started it, everybody was saying 195. Okay. Now I'm up to 20, between 204 and 210. Oh, 210, um, really? Depending on what wow. kind of cut of meat I'm cooking. Okay. If I'm doing a Wagyu, like we're doing today, mm -hmm. the Snake River Farms, there's a lot more fat in it. Mm -hmm. So at 202, it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. It's still got a lot of fat in there, still needs to render it out. So on a higher end brisket like that, I'll take it up to 210, 214. Do you, do you see that big of a difference? Just, you know, five, four to five degrees in the, the way that- Oh yeah, definitely. Wow. Yep. Yeah, okay. huge difference. And at, at 204, it kind of hits a stall again. Okay, the first I, stall is at what, yeah, 165? 100, 150 to 160, it'll okay. stall out. All right. And then again at 204, I find it has another one. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing just like a prime from Costco, mm -hmm. 
I go by a feel. I can probe that brisket at 204 mm. and it feels really tough. I can come back 45 minutes, an hour later, stick my thermometer in there, it just slides right in, but mm. it's still reading 204. Mm. So it, it's, it'll stay there, but it definitely continues to render, it continues to tender up, so. So 206 to 210 right now is For a Wagyu. For a Wagyu, yeah, okay. Usually between 202 and 205 for a prime. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, do I, you, do if you- If I had a choice, I'd do about one night, usually they're about 198 to 202.